So good, good afternoon, everybody. I am a privilege and honor for me to, to welcome uh, two speakers and one discussant. Uh, this is Evi Papa from Universidad Carlos Tercero de, de Madrid. Uh, discussant is uh, Royal Betma. And then we have the second presentation with Marco Passetto from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And unfortunately, our discussant there could not, could not make it. So uh, Marco can speak a bit a bit longer. Uh, as I just said, Efi is professor for macroeconomics at the University Carlos Tercero in Madrid, and she holds also a PhD from Pompeo Fabra. Um, her research is fiscal, um, focusing on fiscal policy, monetary economics, open economy, macroeconomics, business cycle. So this is in the this is exactly the right the right research focus for our conference here. And she will speak about the likely macroeconomic effects from the EU recovery plan. So thanks a lot. And uh, we, we have already uh, set up a uh, half an hour to speak, Efi, uh, and afterwards uh, Royal, and, and then afterwards a discussion. The floor is yours. I thought, sorry, I forgot, sorry. I forgot Good afternoon. That, but sorry, just one remark that all participants can raise uh, questions via the we have a chat function, and uh, I, I can then look at them and, and depending on how much time we have, we can give them uh, to, to, to Efi and later uh, Marco. But uh, uh, you can say whether you want to have questions during your talk or only at the end. So, sorry, Efi, now the floor is yours. Well, uh, I'm honored to be a, a, a participant in this conference. We have already listened like uh, very interesting views about fiscal policy and its interaction with monetary policy. In this uh, talk, I will concentrate on fiscal policy issues. Uh, and yes, uh, you're free to ask me questions during the presentation, so please go ahead. Uh, so I, I start uh, my presentation by giving you this uh, uh, enlightening picture from the ancient Agora in Athens and with uh, enlightened by the next generation in you and the slogan that we will make it real. So uh, I, th I thought also in the previous presentation there was uh, some kind of moderate enthusiasm about the effects of the NGU and uh, uh, the effects of the fiscal policy uh, in uh, this recent current uh, crisis. So, however, you know, we don't really know what is going to be the success of this NGU funds on uh, really bringing growth and recovery uh, as they uh, supposed to. So what we do in this paper with Fabio Canova is that we are going to look at the likely macroeconomic effects of the EU recovery plan and in order to do so, we are going to go to the past experience and try to draw inference from other funds that they look like the uh, NGU funds and they have been actually administered by uh, the EU in different European regions and we try to evaluate what kind of macroeconomic effects these, uh, effects these funds had in the past. So uh, I think that everybody uh, in the, in the uh, public knows what the NGU funds are about. Basically, the majority of the funds are going to come in terms of loans or in terms of grants that they are going to supposedly increase uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the human capital in, uh, in the EU uh, economies. Uh, they will lead to renovation, scaling up digitalization, and uh, upskill and reskill uh, activities. So the issue is, uh, will they create jobs? Will uh, the conversion to a greener economy be smooth? So all these kind of questions that are written in this slide come about when uh, we think about the NGU funds. So uh, what we will do in this paper is we will try to study the regional dynamics produced by major past EU funds that they share characteristics with the NGU funds. In particular, we are going to look at two funds, the European Regional Development Fund, which was launched to foster R&D uh, innovation and to favor the digital agenda and to support small and medium enterprises. And we will also look to the European Social Fund, which was launched to support investments in education and health and also to fight uh, poverty. We will construct a novel database of these regional funds to get, and we will combine it with uh, uh, macroeconomic regional data. 
and we are going then to try to collect some stylized facts about the macroeconomic effects of these funds and try also to highlight uh, whenever we find them regional heterogeneities. At the end, we will present a model that is going to rationalize the average effects of the two funds and also can account for some heterogeneities and we will use the model for policy advice. I don't want to spend time telling you the results. I prefer to show them to you directly. I will not talk about the related literature. If uh, some question comes about later on the discussion, I will do that. So let me explain you a little bit the data that we're using. Here, we're going to use regional macroeconomic data that come from our DECO and they're available online. And we will restrict attention to uh, 279 nuts two units. So this is something between the country unit and the very local unit. So it's like the county in the US data, let's say. So we will have annual data on real gross value added on employment, real compensation, population, uh, investment. And we will construct also series for labor productivity. And we will use data on uh, uh, European funds looking at the historical arch archives uh, that we have on uh, EU funds. Uh, there are various programs that the EU has actually administered as funds to the different European regions, the Cohesion Fund, the Agricultural Fund, uh, and the Fishery Fund lately. But we will concentrate on the ERDF, so the Research and Development, and the ESF, the social fund, because we consider that these two funds are the ones that they mostly resemble the NGU uh, natural funds. So uh, the data, uh, they're kind of difficult to handle. We had to make them real. We had to adjust for gaps. There are some issues about how the expenditures are actually measured in the in your books. We try to arrange all these kind of uh, 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 problems that we had in the data. And uh, with uh, this novel data set, we are going to go to look at uh, the question of interest, which is what is the macroeconomic effects of these funds. Just to give you an idea about how these funds looks like, this is the, the distribution of all the regional funds in the different European regions. So as you can see, there are some recipients like, for example, Spain and Greece and the south of Italy, as well as the accession countries, that they receive much more funds per capita relative like to the Central Europe, like France and Germany. Now, uh, what we're going to do is that we will take here a Bayesian approach because we have only 30 years of data. And uh, in this sense, what we will do is that we will regress the variable of interest that for us, it could be uh, the uh, GVA growth or the employment growth uh, or uh, investment growth, etc. And we will regress it on its own lags. And at the same time, we want to introduce these fund shocks. So the way we are going to create these fund shocks is by cleaning the funds from uh, variations that they have to do with, with the European cycle. So we will do a two-stage regression. In the first stage, we are going to take the funds and we will regress them against like a constant and euro area uh, variables such as euro area GDP, employment, the deflator, the nominal exchange rate, and the residuals of these regressions, we are going to use them as instruments in the regression that you see in the first line of the slide. So actually, the way we're going to, uh, to perform this regression, YIT is going to be the cumulative effect between period T and period H, we're going to use local projection here, of the variable of interest, let's say GVA, while XITH is going to measure the change in the fund that we are going to uh, actually normalize with the GVA of the region. Why are we doing that? Well, because in this way, the coefficient CIH will have a natural interpretation, which is, be, which is going to be the, the multiplier of the fund. Now, because we have some issues with uh, uh, dynamic heterogeneities in the sample, what we're going to do is that we're going to run these uh, local projections region by region for the 279 regions, and we're going to construct a distribution of multipliers that we will then try to cluster according to different characteristics, uh, as uh, you will see uh, uh, very soon. So as I said, uh, because we have a short sample, we're going to use uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian approach, and we're going to impose some, pri impose some priors for the coefficients of interest and for the various covariance matrix of error terms. 
and uh, we are trying to be as agnostic as possible as possible about these uh, priors. And we will also try to control for anticipation and as well as uh, 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 we are going to construct cross-sectional distributions of multipliers. As I told you, we're going to have a, a, a distribution of 279 multipliers that we're going to discipline. And the way we're going to discipline it is by uh, clustering the units according to different characteristics of the regions. And what we will report on the benchmark results is going to be trimmed average effects. So let me go directly to the results. Somebody makes too much noise uh, uh, down here. So what you see here is the average cumulative effects of the multipliers for the different variables of interest. So here on the left column, you see the variables of interest that we, that, uh, we, uh, that we consider. So we have GVA, employment, compensation, investments, labor productivity, and uh, labor force participation. And we have uh, the multipliers for one, two and three years, these multipliers are cumulative for the ERDF and the ESF funds. So as you can see, the first thing to notice is that ERDF funds, if we look at GVA, for example, have an immediate positive uh, multiplier effect, which is pretty big. We are talking about a multiplier of 1.83. Usually the multipliers that we get when we look at government consumption are below one. So getting a multiplier of 1.83, it's significant uh, and uh, uh, important economically uh, multiplier at the first year horizon. However, as the horizon goes by, these are cumulative multipliers, we see that these multipliers decrease, which means that the effect of the, of the shock dissipates as the time goes by. And we see this kind of pattern also if we look at other macroeconomic variables, like for example, investment. We see investment has a similar pattern. And the same is true also for compensation and labor productivity. The only variable in this uh, uh, multipliers that looks, uh, for which it looks like that the effect of the ERDF fund shock persists is participation. When we move now to look at the ESF funds, we see a very different picture. Here, multipliers on impact are insignificant and, if anything, negative. But as time goes by, their effects accumulate, which means that they continue to enhance the economy in the medium run. And we see that if we look at the uh, multipliers for GVA, but we can also see this a similar picture if we look at investments or also at labor productivity and also like in participation. So it appears that if we look at uh, the effects of these funds, it looks like that funds that they are going to promote uh, the research and development, the digital agenda, and small and medium enterprises are going to have effects that are going to be uh, significant, but they're going to be short-lived. And instead, if we look at funds that they look at health and education, we are going to have uh, insignificant impact effects, but we will have very strong uh, medium impact effects. So now we are going to do in the analysis a lot of sensitivity analysis. Well, we have 279 units there in the regions for which we include also the UK. So what happens if we exclude the UK or we look only at Euro area members or we look, or we look at the data after 2000? This is what we do in this graph. And for comparisons, we also report here the baseline results. So what we observe basically is that the ERDF funds multipliers are kind of sensitive to what kind of sample we are going to use. So for example, if we use like only Euro area countries, it appears, I'm really sorry for the noise. It appears that uh, the, the multiplier effects are, are stronger for EU area countries even three years after the shock. Uh, and it is not the case, for example, if we look at, uh, at uh, the countries that include UK. And with respect to the ESF funds uh, multipliers, we, we have a robust uh, uh, picture in the sense that in all, in all the experiments that we do, we also observe, uh, we always observe the same pattern, which is zero impact effects, but very strong cumulative effects after three years. Now, uh, we have also looked at spillover effects, and we, we wanted to investigate whether the effects of the multipliers are stronger in the region or they actually spill over to the whole country. So here, what we are calculating is cumulative multipliers at the national level of these same funds. And if then these numbers are higher than what we have seen at the regional level, it means that we have positive spillover effects. If they are smaller, the spillovers are actually negative. 
So what we see is for the ERDF funds, we seem to have some positive spillovers, but they are not really significant. And if we look at the ESF funds, what we observe is that actually we have some negative spillovers. And these negative spillovers come from actually the investments crowding out. If you look at the fourth uh, row of this uh, table, what you would observe is that investment multipliers at the national level for these funds are actually negative, which implies that if I have an investment in Andalusia in Spain, this is going to crowd out investments in other regions in Spain, like Madrid, Barcelona, or, or, or Asturias. So to give you an idea what, what this negative spillover will mean. So uh, uh, then we have looked at a heterogeneous effects. So we have compared northern regions versus southern regions and old uh, regions of the EU versus younger regions of the EU. So what we observe here is that it matters where you are located for the size of the loop of the multiplier and it seems like that both kind of funds have much stronger effects if you are located in the south where the south uh, the south here is like loosely determined it is bulgaria cyprus germany spain uh, croatia hungary italy portugal romania and slovakia uh, and slovenia sorry and it also looks like that if i belong to a young member of the EU, like Bulgaria, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, Croatia, Hungary, Latvia, Poland, Romania, uh, Slovenia, or Slovakia, the multipliers dissipate extremely fast. They have, a, a, for example, for ERDF funds, they have a positive effect on impact that dissipates immediately after two years, while the ESF funds, they have effects that they uh, remain for two years, but they start dissipate, dissipate uh, uh, in the third year after the, the shock, which means that here the medium run effects for this kind of countries are much smaller. Now, another exercise that we do, which we think is very important, is to cluster our units according to income to, to the uh, income per capita in the different regions that we that we consider. So we will construct four quantiles for the income uh, uh, distribution. And we will look at how the multipliers one, two, and three years of the ERDF funds. So here we look at the multipliers of all the variables that we have in the analysis uh, uh, change with the quantile of income that we consider. The uh, takeaway of this picture is that multipliers for ERDF funds are going to be always more significant on impact, but also in the medium run for regions that, that they belong in the sec that they belong, sorry, in the second and the third quantile. What does this mean? This means that these regions are going to take the, the, the most out of these uh, uh, funds, and actually they are going to catch up with uh, with, uh, 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 with with the reach. While what we when we look at the poor and and the rich, we see that the effect of these funds. Is uh, are the, the the regions for which the effects of these this funds is actually kind of uh, temporary. Now, if we look at ESF funds, we will see a very similar picture. Again, we look at quartiles uh, of the income distribution, and what we look is at the at the uh, one, two, and three year multipliers. And here I show you GVA, but you can see that for all the variables that we consider, the effects are similar. We see again, it is that the medium income regions that mostly uh, take advantage of, uh, of, uh, of, of this NGU funds and they grow faster after three years. While we see that the multipliers for, uh, uh, for the first quantile dissipate pretty fast. And it looks like that for these funds also the REITs kind of, of taking advantage uh, of these uh, uh, funds also in the medium run. So this is a picture that shows that whether I'm going to look at ESF or ERDF funds, it looks like that both funds might create income polarization. And this is something that we should be aware of. So uh, if we now uh, uh, cluster multipliers at the country level, and we look for, for example, our ERDF funds. This map is a map in which red is bad and purple is good. Why? Because red depicts multipliers in regions for uh, GVA and employment that they're both negative after three years. And the, the, the purple instead is good because we have 
uh, we are representing with purple here the regions for which three years GVA and employment multipliers are positive after three years. So what do we observe is here we have a polarization. We have regions in Europe in which we have a lot of purples and regions in Europe for which we have a lot of red, which means that, you know, regions in which the multipliers for ERDF works and multi regions in which it does not work. And we have some, only few regions in the middle for which, a few countries in the middle, like Portugal, for which, for example, we have negative GVA uh, multipliers, but positive employment multipliers. And the green regions here are the opposite, are regions in which, uh, countries in which we have positive GVA multipliers, but negative employment multipliers. So it looks like that not everybody will benefit the same from this kind of, uh, of funds. Uh, if we look at RDF, but if then we move at ESF funds, we see a more purple uh, picture and uh, purple and, and green, which means that this is good. So now all Central Europe looks like to be affected positive by the ESF funds, and we have very few regions that they are still in red in which the funds do not have any medium run effects. So uh, let me uh, uh, conclude and uh, try to uh, recap my facts before I go to the theoretical model. So what I saw you so far is that ERDM, ERDF funds seems to be useful, useful for short-run purposes, while ESF funds look to be better suited to foster medium-term objectives. The macroeconomic effects of the ERDF funds are kind of uh, less robust, but in general, they are not persistent while the ESF funds have more persistent effects. We have regional dynamic responses that are very heterogeneous. We have country-specific features like location, tenure, tenure in the EU, and the level of development that matter for these differences. And in the response to these programs, it looks like that lower peripheral, peripheral sorry, and newly tenured regions of the EU do not take full advantage of these funds and underperform in terms of recovery and transformation. So having said that, I would like now to go to try to interpret in the 10 minutes that I have left uh, my uh, the dynamics that we see in the data. So what we will do now is that we are going to build a two country model of a monetary union where we are going to have a small country, which is going to be uh, a home country, which is going to be small and it's going to be the region within like a monetary union. And this kind of model will have standard nuclear nation features because we want to generate effects of uh, these funds that they will have like uh, that will be important for demand. So we want to generate demand effects from fiscal policy. But at the same time, we also want to generate supply effects from fiscal policy because everybody said in the in the past uh, one hour that what we expect from the NGU funds is growth and we want to have G increasing more than R. So this means that we want to incorporate in our analysis uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, in contrast with previous uh, uh, theoretical models about fiscal policy, growth and fiscal policy affecting growth. For that reason, we're going to have endogenous growth that is going to come through R&D and human capital accumulation. And we are going to assume that the federal expenditure is going to be uh, financed with local income and lump sum taxes. And uh, the uh, uh, federal government is going to provide funds that they're going to enhance R&D and human capital accumulation in the home economy. The monetary policy is going to be conducted with a Taylor rule at the union level. And we're going to try to look at different ways the funds might be administered in the regional economy. So what is key here, and I want to highlight that, is that the federal government spending is going to affect the R&D and the human capital accumulation. So I don't have time to, to explain you in detail the model, but basically what I'm going to have is agents that they will derive utility from consumption. And this consumption good is going to be a, a tradable good. And so it's going to be a good that it is domestically produced with uh, which I uh, write here as CHD. And CFT is going to be the composite of goods that they come from abroad. ETA is going to uh, determine what is the home bias in consumption. And the agents in the economy are going to derive utility from this composite uh, consumption good and this utility from working and from going to the school or getting educated. So MT here is that this utility that I get from uh, getting educated. 
Uh, so now what we're going to assume is that we will have a human capital accumulation equation in which HT is human capital and it's going to accumulate as almost uh, it happens in all these models with human capital accumulation. The sense it will depend on human capital in the previous period, but it's going to depreciate and it might depreciate faster depending on the utilization of human capital. But what is more important is that in order to build human capital, I have to study. And studying together with the aggregate human capital is going to generate the new production of human capital. What we're going to assume in this model is that it can be that by uh, giving funds to human capital accumulation, the government is enhancing the investment in human capital. So that's what we're going to call HK accumulation. We might also think that actually the, the NGU funds are not going to come as direct subsidies to investment in human capital, but uh, as, uh, sorry, spending in human capital, but they might come as subsidies to human capital. So in this case, what we will assume uh, uh, is that in the household budget constraint, we will have this term STM in, in, uh, in, uh, in yellow in the slide, which is going to be the subsidy that the agents are going to receive for allocating time in, uh, in, uh, in, in education. So, and we will call this uh, 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 case in our, in our slides later on, AK, uh, 8K subsidies. So, we assume that the, the NGU funds can be either administered directly through investment in human capital accumulation or through subsidies in human capital. Now, I will not have time to describe very much uh, the economy in detail, so I will just move in the last five minutes to tell you what is the R&D accumulation in the model. Here, when we're going to, to, uh, to assume that we have R&D accumulation, we will assume that the R&D accumulation in the economy can actually affect directly the production function, and in particular, it can affect the TFP in the economy. The TFP is this variable ZT, and we are assuming that the Z, ZT is actually going to depend on R&D uh, investment, uh, R&D capital, uh, and uh, uh, GTRD is going to affect the, uh, the, uh, the uh, our labor augmenting uh, 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 total factor productivity, uh, in the way that I present here in the second equation. Or, if you don't like this assumption, we can also assume that the government, as in the case of the human capital, is directly investing in the, in, uh, in the accumulation of uh, R&D. And this is going to be through the accumulation of R&D in the third equation here. And as you can see, we have this function here, omega, in which uh, government spending in R&D is going to enter the accumulation of uh, R&D capital. Or, if you don't like this, this assumption, we can also assume that the R&D is coming to wholesale firms as subsidies. So, uh, the government can administer uh, the uh, R&D uh, uh, funds either directly enhancing TFP or through the accumulation of R&D or through R&D subsidies. So here, I don't have time to talk to you about the responses of the economy and what happens more or less. So let me move uh, directly to show you the multipliers that the model generates. Basically, we are able to match what we see in the data. We have output multipliers that they, they are very high uh, on impact and they dis dissipate as time goes by, especially for the case in which we assume that the R&D is uh, the, the, the G funds go to R&D accumulation or to R&D subsidies, and less so when we look at the TFP. What is the intuition behind this result? Now I will go to my slides. So the intuition be, be, be behind this result is very simple. If I give money uh, as fiscal spending in the accumulation of R&D, and I, I don't give them, and this money do not enhance directly TFP, then what is going to happen is the increase in government spending coming to R&D investment is not going to come hand in hand with, the, with an increase in the capital investment. Instead, if I manage to affect uh, TFP directly with my NGU funds, with my R&D investment, then you see the blue line here tells you that I'm going to increase the capital investment and this is going to generate more persistent effects of R&D in the economy. Now, 
If we look at ESL funds, we have the, the, the pattern of responses that I show you uh, 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 in the empirical model. We don't match the magnitudes. That is because the model has uh, its limitations. But the mechanism behind this kind of multipliers is best explained here. When we have an increase in human capital investments, what is going to happen is that people will move out of the labor force and they will go to study. So they will increase the education in hours. Now, this increase in education in hours is going to bring down uh, 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 the working hours and it's going to make uh, labor very expensive. So in the short run, this is going to have costs. But as the increase in hours is going to enhance the accumulation of human capital, this effect is going to dominate and we are going to see the positive medium multipliers that we see in the model. So I have probably one minute. We have tried to explain also the heterogeneity. I don't have time to explain you. What I want to finish my presentation with, with is the case of grants versus loans. In the data, we have grants, but in reality, in NGU funds, we have also loans. So inside the model, we can address the issue. What happens if I use loans and grants instead of just grants to finance these NGU investments? So the, 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 the meaning behind this picture that probably you don't understand anything because it's so many things uh, tagged here is that if I use loans, I am going to have short run effects, uh, negative effects from uh, 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 the NGU uh, funds. So the multipliers are going to be much smaller, uh, and especially in some cases, much smaller than what I would get if I would have only grants. So uh, I want not to run out of time. So let me recap. I try to show you what are the possible effects of NGU funds. The outcome looks moderate, uh, moderately optimistic but we have to be careful because there can be uh, uh, reasons to worry about uh, polarization. In the model, we suggest uh, policies that will make the outcome more optimistic. And we suggest like what kind of administration of funds as well as what kind of structural characteristics are needed for these funds to work at their maximum. And we have also been able to rationalize the, uh, 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 the average effect. Now, I would like to thank you for your attention. I think I'm a little bit uh, over time. I think that we should all think that the future of Europe is going to be, as these kids have depicted it in this picture, uh, bright and full of uh, stars. And uh, I, I uh, personally think that uh, we can make it. And this is also what my research outcome uh, suggests. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful, wonderful, and terrific uh, presentation and research work. I'm not going to ask a question now, and there have been already several questions in the chat. We are going to that after the uh, discussion, but thank you, Evie, that was really, and also the, the timing was spot on. I took two minutes and you took 30 minutes. Now I'm going directly to uh, to Raoul Bezma, uh, who all of us know is, is the, the European Fiscal Board and University of Amsterdam. So the floor is yours. Good. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Um, and thanks the organization for having me. Um, let me just see. Can you, I suppose you can see my slides, right? Um, so I uh, I was uh, quite happy with this uh, you know final slide by by AV which uh, you know is on the optimistic note I'm also optimistic uh, I think uh, probably the future of Europe is better than many of us uh, think um, I think this paper is it's a very very rich paper um, and it deals with um, you know very important issue. Um, and that has not been really been analyzed. I mean, not in the in the well in an econometric quantitative way in the way that uh, uh, Fabio and Avi do. And so, what are the likely macro effects of the EU recovery plan? And there are a number of, of course, a number of important questions um, uh, when it comes to the RRF. Um, so. Um, one of the questions is when will it be considered a success? And, um, and that is a very important question because if it is a success, it can be a stepping stone 
for uh, a permanent fund to uh, strengthen the structure of the EU economy or maybe a bigger EU budget um, and potentially pave the way for a central fiscal capacity, which uh, was also discussed in the previous uh, session. Um, Another uh, question is, is the effect of the uh, RRF, is it temporary or long term? And so temporary, I mean, it is, it, does it cause a shift in output or does it really cause an increase in growth? Um, sorry, I, I mean, this is, you know, my, my institution tries to save energy, so the lights uh, disappear sometimes. Um, the third question, what are the relative roles on expanding the supply side and increasing demand? Because the RF has, you know, affects both sides and I will say something about that. Um, and um, what the paper could not really address um, because it's, you know, how would you say it's very, in a way, not so tangible and it differs a lot across countries is the role of the, uh, of the reform component. And how that interacts with the uh, investment component of uh, of the uh, no, of the uh, facility. Um, so, contribution of this paper tries to affect the uh, assess the effects of RF. Um, as I said, important, interesting. It really addresses a gap in the literature, um, and um, uh, and importantly in this paper. The assessment can only be done indirectly, necessarily, because there are no data uh, at the moment. And um, so, how does how do the authors do that? They do that in a creative way because they look at existing programs that are closest to the RRF. That is the European Regional Development Fund and the uh, European Social Fund. Um, and so they um, they do the estimations um, and of the um, well of the subsidy or the what is the the, the, the transfer impulses um, on a number of uh, of variables. And um, given that the RRF is relatively close to these uh, funds, we may you know this this says something. We expect this to say something on the effects of RRF. Um, they also um, try to um, analyze further uh, by setting up a new Keynesian two, two country model uh, with, uh, you know, with R&D spending and education spending so as to uh, you know, further trace out the potential effects of, uh, of the RF. Um, so um, I think two important um, well, what is crucial in this paper are two important elements. Um, to what extent does the composition of the uh, two existing uh, regional funds um, match that of the RF? And to what extent does the theoretical framework capture the main features of the RF? I think these are two crucial questions on which I want to say something. Um, before doing that, um, a few words on the empirical analysis. The uh, paper is um, uh, not only original in addressing the question, so what are the effects of the RF, but it also is one of the few papers to use regional data. Um, and I think the, um, you know, the regional data are very rich, but they are uh, underexplored. And there are some exceptions, uh, a recent paper by uh, Sebastian Houtmeyer uh, last year, which looks at the regional effects of monetary policy shocks and um, Jacopo and uh, another uh, co-author, we have, uh, we are working on a central fiscal capacity paper where we also use uh, regional data. Now, um, of course, um, there may be an endogenous effect from economic outcomes to the transfers that regions uh, receive. So that is for that reason, the authors uh, deploy a two-step procedure. So they first regress the uh, real structural funds on a constant and some other uh, variables. And then what they do, they include the residual from this regression in um, you know the regression that is the focus and you know for which they uh, show the uh, the impulse uh, responses um, and um, 
they uh, they have something like 290 regions so they can also do a number of dissections of the data for example uh, north versus south uh, but also based on average income so it's a very rich uh, exercise i think the uh, theoretical framework was briefly explained but but well explained um uh, in, uh, one aspect i will go into that is that uh, the, the taxes are collected at the local level, then they are transferred to the federal level, and all this spending is done at federal level in the in the model. I think uh, the paper could provide a little bit more information, just basic statistical information, uh, some key macro variables for the regions, the transfers uh, received by the regions. So I see the map, but uh, one of the questions, and I'm not familiar with these transfer data, so I, um, you, you know, it's I may be mistaken, but I was wondering, um, you know, whether there are many observations with zero transfers and whether that has uh, uh, has some effect of on the uh, empirics. Um, and I think it would be useful to say more. And this is probably quite kind of well laborious, um, you know, exercise to say more on the composition of recovery and resilience plans. Um, uh, so um, what is exactly in it, uh, in those plans? And these plans, they differ, of course, from country to country, but some information on this and, um, you know, how that corresponds to the um, to the other, uh, to the existing uh, funds would be, uh, would be useful. Um, uh, I think, um, well, so uh, the effects of the transfers, both in the RRF, but also in the funds that are uh, studied in detail by the authors, they could run via supply and the demand side. And so I think these are mostly discussed in, in, in terms of, well, supply, but they can also have an effect via demand side. And that is also the case in the theoretical model. So I was wondering whether we could, um, how you say, you know, whether they could do something to disentangle these two channels. Um, and um, so one possibility would be to take the basic regression that, uh, well, that, okay, that, that was a few slides ago, uh, the basic regression and interact the transfers with slack in the economy, or maybe whether the economy is, the is at the effective lower bound. And so get an idea whether the transfers are um, more effective um, when there is a lot of overcapacity. Yeah? So the transfers have, of course, a supply effect via knowledge accumulation or uh, investment. But the question is also, OK, um, you know, what is the uh, how does the effectiveness of them depend on the uh, on the situation in business cycle? Um, and, uh, you know, a number of, of findings struck me um, because um, I, I mean, one of the funds uh, that is um, the R ERDF focuses more on spending on innovation, research, digital agenda. And I was struck by the fact that the positive effects die out so quickly, um, which would suggest that, and, and these are also investments. Um, uh, so I, I was quite surprised about this. I was quite surprised about the difference of the effects for the two uh, types of uh, for, for the two funds um and um i think i it would also be good to know a little bit more about uh, what is driving the differences between um the estimates for the uh, for the entire eu and for the euro area um because i saw in the tables i saw quite large differences and um, uh, i think especially in the what is the ERDF um, for EU versus uh, Euro? Well, the Euro area is, of course, about 90% of the EU economy. So I was wondering how this can be uh, explained. I thought the findings on the, uh, you know, when you kind of, uh, you know, uh, dissect the data by, uh, by quartile of income, I thought that was very interesting. Um, and so the middle quartiles, they benefit most from the, uh, from the, uh, from the impulses. Um, uh, 
Um, a few other maybe uh, smaller comments. Um, uh, but let me let me go to my final two slides. That is, um, um, there are two in a way two important mappings in the paper. I had to say something about what are the effects of RRF. Um, I think it is important to um, have a bit more explicit mapping between the existing funds that are investigated and the RRF. So uh, uh, a more explicit uh, comparison of the composition of the spendings. Um, and of course, I mean, maybe it would be good to look at one or a couple of RRFs uh, because these are very, uh, you know, big, well, large, you know, amount of pages, so to say. Um, to what extent does the financing coincide? Um, um, and maybe quite importantly, um, and then I'm coming back to the state of the economy. Uh, probably, I mean, the RRF, these, these plans, they come uh, into existence at quite rather specific uh, moments in time. Eh? Because this is, uh, you know, when we are coming out of the COVID crisis, hopefully uh, coming out of the COVID crisis, well, the um, estimates, they are, of course, that have been shown, they are, of course, in a way, averages across all the, uh, all the uh, business cycles. Um, then the RRF contains a reform component. Um, of course, um, it differs in that way from the, um, from the existing funds. And um, another difference is that the recovery plans, uh, the RRF, uh, plans they are not necessarily region uh, region based. Well, the, um, the the funds that are studied in the paper they are uh, based on the uh, on the regions. Now, finally, um, my final um, uh, issue is uh, question is about the mapping between the theoretical framework that is presented, which I uh, like very much, and the RF, and uh, of course. Um, as I was saying, um, the RF is both about investment and reform. Of course, um, you know, to model reform will be very difficult in the uh, in, in the theoretical framework. Um, but in a way, the model is more suitable for the RF than for the funds uh, had the ERDF and the ESF because it is a model not of of regions but of two countries. And so I was wondering whether you could potentially take a more direct approach and, uh, you know, go to the RF, look at the uh, components of some of the plans and then uh, calibrate the model directly to the main components of the RF. Um, on the model, I think um, it might be um, interesting to also have some uh, differentiation between the two countries. Eh? We know that the um, well, the financing of the RF is, of course, um, unequally unequally distributed. So you could uh, maybe assume um, in your theoretical model a poorer and a richer uh, country, and then um, do some uh, you know impulse uh, response analysis. Um, so let me stop here and uh, hand over um, back to Klaus. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a uh, very good uh, discussion, focusing on the paper, many, many interesting additional aspects. I would, uh, we have a number of questions in the chat and I will try to summarize them and give first the floor to, to Evi and then to Rol. Uh, I think it all, also all the questions together and then you can see where you would like to reply or focus on. Uh, a first issue is more a clarification that Attorney De Rucci stresses that there is of course a difference between new generation EU and this and these existing funds, EFI, which you have uh, investigated, namely that now there is a lot of effort to implement a proper governance structure, first completion of milestones and so on. So, so how would you see that this difference uh, between the this governance difference between the RRF and the old funds which you have investigated or the previous funds could be could be addressed. Then uh, uh, Marco has uh, a, a more technical question. What do you think about human capital depreciation, which normally is assumed to be slower than because you have learning by doing and so on, than depreciation of physical capital. 
But Francesco Zanetti asked the question, I think that's, I have also thought about this, whether you have looked at, say, differences in the, in the policy, in the, in the quality of administration, quality of administration, quality of institutions across uh, different uh, regions. There is some literature which tries to link poor quality has then certain spending has less effect. But when I look at, at your results, I would I would think that uh, it's perhaps not not so simple. And and perhaps if you if you could you turn around uh, your results and say okay those regions which are very successful using these funds maybe they have a better quality of administration or institutions than we normally think. Or that could be a a check of what the World Bank or the or the other uh, say the other institutions which assess quality of, of governance uh, are doing. So uh, in that in that respect, uh, there is another uh, question by, by Jacopo who says whether you control in step one and two for national and regional fiscal policy. And I would want to add uh, an own observation from my uh, perspective. Uh, have you tried to say? Every region, there is a catching up process, and you take an average catching up across regions. You assume that certain that every region would catch up with a certain speed to the say to the euro area average level or the best performance in terms of, of, of productivity or GDP, and then you you assess how these funds would would impact on on a, a, a on this uh, speed of catching up. Do countries or regions, sorry, regions which get the funds catch up? faster or less fast than what you would on average assume given their position in the productivity level or the maturity of their economy. That would be uh, in the perspective which you could also bring in. So, sorry, I now uh, added uh, many of the, um, all the questions together and uh, let's see what, what, you, what, you, what your reply is. Uh, if you well, first of all, I would like to thank you all for your attention and your comments and more, more than a buddy Royal, because like a uh, moral, I have here two pages of comments and it's very good. So, uh, uh, let me tell you like, uh, something on the basic ones. So, uh, about the mapping of RRF and ERDF and ESF, I'm with you. What I could do in, uh, empirically at least. Uh, is that I could uh, look at the funds and try like to see which ones really correspond exactly to what is uh, like RRF, it can, it can be considered as RRF, and repeat my regressions only for these funds that they could be thought only as RRF. And this is something that we can do and it's easy to address. Then I think you gave me a very good suggestion that could be another paper, uh, which is, okay, take your theoretical model, it looks like it's good for RRF and try to calibrate like your model and try to talk about the RRF looking at your theoretical economy. Uh, I think that, I mean, I think that it, this is a very good suggestion, but I don't think it it, it is um, it, it is going to be adequate to do everything in this model because already in this model we're doing too much. I mean, this paper is like you have seen it, it's like very long and uh, I don't want to make it like longer. However, I have to say that the model helped me in some directions. So, for example, you told me before that, you know, you don't understand why the ERDF effects uh, dissipate so fast. Uh, and oh, actually, you also told me, you know, I don't remember if it was you, somebody else, I don't remember, uh, that it is, there's a difference, it was you, between the euro area and the EU regions. So, it looks like that this is driven by the poor and actually the newcomers. Now, what happens with the newcomers, something that we were not aware of when we were writing the paper and we have been told afterwards. For the ERDF funds, the new accession countries have the possibility, if they don't use the ERDF funds for their, for their scope, they can use them for other uses. This is what they will have been told. So, for example, in Bulgaria, if you don't use the money uh, uh, to create, uh, like to subsidize new firms, you can use them to fix pavements. So, it looks like that this effect of the ERDF that, you know, if they dissipate so fast, it could come from the administration of the funds. Now, the way we saw this in the model is by looking at these reversals. So, what is the reversals? Basically, what we want to do is like we say, look, in order for the fund to have effects, it needs to be persistent. You know, I'm not going to invest in capital if I know that the ERDF, the call for patents for the EU is here today and tomorrow is going to be gone. 
because this is this is going to definitely generate a reversal. So in the model, what we say is that whenever you have a, this kind of reversal, what is going to happen is that the effect of 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 the shock is going to uh, 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 to dissipate very very fast. Now. I want to go now to talk a little bit about human capital depreciation because I think it's very important. It is true. One would think that you know human capital depreciation should be much smaller, and actually we calibrate it to be much smaller. But I think that in a very stylized model, I mean stylized, whatever, it's very big. But anyways, in a, in a model like ours, which we cannot uh, actually model everything, what human capital depreciation stands for is migration of skilled workers of of uh, of uh, of uh, human capital so in these accession countries we have a lot of migration of high of high skill agents and also like in greece i mean i i, I come from there i know so uh, like there is brain drain and the way that we could capture brain drain in our model is through this depreciation of human capital and if we do so we do actually find that if this human capital depreciation is very high obviously the effect of these HK funds, the human capital uh, funds, is dissipating also fast because basically you give the money somewhere and at the end, uh, like this human capital is just leaving your account. Okay? So uh, uh, now, institutions. Institutions is something which is very important. And uh, the only thing that we can do is that we will cluster our units at country level because we think at the country level, the institutions are similar. Now, Francesco will tell me, go to Naples and go to Milan and compare. Yes, I agree. But uh, there is not too much I can do because I don't have any uh, data on institutions. What I could do maybe, but I mean, this is going to be with uh, like recent data, is to use the Eurobarometer information about how, uh, like uh, questions that they have there, like how uh, uh, happy you, you are, like uh, with uh, the administration and the governors. But I mean, I don't have data for the 1980s for these uh, things, like or like I could use like more recent data. But it's something I, I could try to uh, 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 to address this way. Jacobo, thank you very much for the comment. Yes, we have uh, we are. Uh, we have some regressions in which we control for uh, uh, national uh, fiscal policy, not uh, not regional. And also, we have also uh, some experiments in in which we also control for national income. Uh, since national uh, income versus uh, uh, EU income, they are kind of correlated. Business cycles are correlated. It doesn't make a big difference. Uh, cuts up, uh, Klaus. Thank you very much. But we haven't looked at this. Maybe I think the only way we can think about cuts up is like we're looking at the quantiles that uh, that uh, we are doing currently. I mean, I I need to think a little bit more about how we can do it in another way. And and finally, a very important comment from Royal that I really appreciate. And you know, Royal, I also thought about it is about this non-linearity. So Royal said. Evie, look, I mean, we're talking about the RRF, but the RRF are here because we are under the COVID and we want to see how they are going to affect the economy, given that we are in a recession. So it would be great if we could do like state dependence and look at the zero load bound or look at the recession versus expansions, but we only have 28 years of annual data. So like with the data that we have, we have done, I think, the best we could. So I will leave it here. I left you three minutes there, Royal Camo. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I mean, fascinating that you addressed really all the questions, Evie. Uh, that was was very good. And now we go to Royal. I mean, I, I, you have given that we we have no no discussion in the next session. You 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 have yeah. three, three minutes. <laughs> well, well, uh, okay. Thank you, Klaus. Let me say a few few words. Um, uh, I thought. Um, you know, there were some in very interesting things in the reply by Avi, and that is uh, on the issue of uh, of migration of skilled workers. So I think that it is important to think very carefully about how you say the design of these uh, of these transfers. And um, you know, when I think, <laughs> but when when I think of um, um, the RF is, um, I see the RF as a, in a way, a patchwork of national plans and um, because they are designed at the national level. And, you know, what comes out of it is in a way somewhat, uh, 
well, I, somewhat arbitrary configuration of plants. Well, actually, the kind of the spillover effects are not really explicit part of the uh, of the plants. And so, I thought that uh, you know, thinking about the spillover effects of of funds, I think it's uh, it's very uh, uh, very important. Just on the um, on on the regressions themselves, going back, I, I can see there are few, well. 30, 30 years of data, but still, I think one could probably split dissect the data set into, say, you know, uh, above average and below average growth and do a, you know, tentative uh, regression to see whether the effects of the funds are, uh, are different. Maybe they are not, but, um, uh, you know, given the Kind of the specific moment that the RF, um, you know, funds become available, it's uh, it might be useful to do such a thing and to say a bit more about you know uh, kind of of the comparison between the work on the two um, funds and the RF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh um, there is there is another question, but I think perhaps better uh, to uh, if you to to address it to discuss bilaterally with Luis Fonseca on endogeneity concerns. Um, uh, but if you if you uh, if you have say last uh, say last minute, Efi, and then we uh, comment on everything and also what Raul said, and then we go to the next session. Yes. Uh and the genetic concerns are getting what in the regressions? Yeah, and, yeah and this is from, from Luis Fonseca who said uh, that the methodology cleans the, the fund attribution from common EU level factors and uses the residuals. My concern is that I would think that it's exactly those residuals that are more likely to be correlated with regional unobservables, making them not the best instruments. Wouldn't actually the variation driven by common EU factors and thus, independent of individual region, be the better variation to use as an instrument? Oh, well, uh, I mean, we have, uh, I thought that like the, endo the endogeneity uh, would come from the fact that, you know, this, uh, this kind of funds come like, uh, like at, uh, in, in like times where like, they, you know, I, we were trying to, to control endogeneity, thinking like about, uh, uh, whether, uh, the funds were going uh, during good times and these good times, uh, were actually capturing this positive multiplier. Now, uh, that's exactly what I thought that we were trying to do. We were trying to 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 get the the the, the residual that would clean like that would have like only the regional component that it would be clean for for other stuff, and 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 use that not in relation to anything but in relation to the fund. So we were using like this uh, residual as an instrument for the fund that was given in the specific region. So. Uh, I am not sure I understand why this is going to be uh, problematic or like that we're capturing an idiosyncratic component of, re of the region. Like, um, is he afraid that this specific region had a specific characteristic that got this fund? Uh, like, is this uh, the concern? If, uh, like, if uh, this is what I understand. A and then I would say, as long as this is not the uh, related to the business cycle conditions, I think that we should be fine. Okay, very good. I mean, I think you can continue discussing uh, with Luis Fonseca this, this bilaterally okay. uh, by email because we have uh, reached the, the end of our, our first session in this. In this okay, afternoon. thank you. Thank you very much, Evi. Thank you all. I found a fascinating discussion and really good that, that you're looking at the, at the data and the past experience to get some idea what what could happen with the RRF funds and uh, and of course the, the arguments about institution and what Ettore said about governance will will play a major role.